Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome back, wildlings. Memory, lessons learned, and even nostalgia are very important to some folks. Important as in verging on obsession. Say what you will about living in the past, it just takes one little anomalous clue to send our minds down the road not taken. And this often leads us to uncover things that are dangerous to mess with. As in our story of this dysfunctionally devilish crazy Canuck, 1999. The year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we used to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain in my mind, however, as a memory that will not go away no matter how I try to forget it. 1999 marked the year that I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately the early loss of my childhood innocence. That one memory refuses to be wiped. It all started with that new, or I suppose old, TV. At that time, Pokemon was the latest fad to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers, and most popular, the TV show. So of course, Every time I came home from school, I would stay glued to the TV until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30, and Pokemon episodes were back to back, which meant that I had to miss an episode every day, something I whined on about constantly. My dad got tired of hearing me complain every day. That must be why he went and bought me another TV. My dad put the TV he bought in my room. Unfortunately, it was just an old, small boob tube, even had rabbit ears. It also only had 20 channels available, not including the channel Pokemon was on. I really didn't care though. I was just thrilled that I had my own TV in my room. After surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that only Channel 2, TVO Kids, was worth watching, so I watched that for a while. It wasn't for another few months that I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was flipping through the channels trying to see if Pokemon was on any of them. I pressed Channel 21 into the remote hoping that there might be more channels to watch and to my delight, there was. My dad was surprised too, but he let me watch it anyway because it seemed to have kids programming on. The channel was called Caledon Local 21, and I later found out that it was indeed broadcasted from the town of Caledon, Ontario, a town very close to the city I lived in. The shows that I saw on Caledon Local 21 looked poorly made, and I never understood what was going on in them half the time. However, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realized more and more how messed up the shows were, and I had to ask myself, what the fuck was I watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember seeing on Caledon Local 21. How I remember such detail disturbs even me, but I guess things like this stand out in your mind for a while. The channel only ran a few shows, probably because it was only operational between 4 o'clock p.m. and 9 o'clock p.m. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 12 very sketchy name if you were to look back at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume who would get a new visitor every day into his cellar. These visitors were always kids. The show was filmed with a camcorder. Not a very good one either. The police asked me a lot of questions about this show. This episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at a table playing checkers by himself. He sat there playing for a bit until there was a knock at the door. The cameraman then turned to look up the stairs at the door where there was another knock. Mr. Bear climbed the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age and the other was a girl who looked to be about eight. Mr. Bear danced in delight and then started talking to the kids. 
I couldn't hear any of them that well, I remember. Uh, Mr. Bear then led the kids into the cellar, which was quite dark, only lit by a small lamp on the table. I can't really remember that much more about it, except uh, he sang a song that I couldn't hear too well either, probably because of the bear mask he wore. The episode ended with them playing hide-and-seek with the kids hiding in a closet and Mr. Bear counting. Soup and Spoon I don't think this was even a show. I think it was more of a little skit or a special movie type of thing. All I know is that I stopped watching Caledon Local 21 for a while because I thought this show was stupid, especially since Pokemon came on at 4.30 now and then 5 o'clock. I don't remember much of this, but it showed a can of soup and a spoon both attached to strings, swinging back and forth as if someone were holding them and dangling them in front of the camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement, which looked just like the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I can't remember much. The only thing that I really do remember clearly was the end. The entire thing was only half an hour and just included stuff that I found stupid, like I said, such as the spoon chasing the soup around trying to eat him. The ending showed a table with about seven kids sitting around it, each with a bowl of soup in front of them. They were sitting and looking at the camera, but they were confused, almost frightened. The cameraman then held the can of soup up in front of the kids and said, Spoons ready? And then it just stopped. It was summer, and I hadn't watched Channel 21 for a while, until one day when I slept over at my friend's house, and I decided to check it out again. My friend had gotten a TV in his room for his sixth birthday, so we stayed up very late. 9.30, <laughs> for us, was very late, and watched TV. That's when I remembered Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on, and to our surprise, it was. They must have changed the broadcasting times. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 23. This episode was entertaining for my friend and me, mainly because it had swearing. However, now when I think of this episode, I realize that something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side while it was facing Mr. Bear who was walking upstairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for about a second before fading in, back upright, and facing Mr. Bear. There was also a child talking to him, but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while, but I couldn't hear very well, again with the crappy camcorder and the bear mask until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying how it was late and his sister had to go home. You could also hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, Get the fuck out! You're not invited! with a deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looking at each other and laughing at the mention of the forbidden F-word. But the episode got even weirder. The kid began to climb the stairs before turning around and saying how he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking into a run toward the kid, who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel then turned to static shortly after. I didn't want to watch Channel 21 after that. In August, though, I grew more curious to see Mr. Bear's cellar for some reason. The last episode that I saw of Mr. Bear had been weird and had swearing, which also made me think that the show might be meant for teenagers now. Nonetheless, I flipped onto Channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 28. Apparently, this episode had been playing for the entire month of August. It was studied a lot by the police. The entire episode was just Mr. Bear sitting in a chair talking to the audience. Hello, kids. Do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, please write me a letter at this address. The screen then switched to a whiteboard with multicolored letters reading the address, 
and that was what remained for the rest of the episode. This repeated for five hours every day until September came. And guess what I actually did? I sent Mr. Bear, or that sick bastard who portrayed him, a letter. I did it out of curiosity, mostly. Uh, my dad was okay with it because he thought that it was a legit kids show, but then again, he never saw any of what was on Channel 21. So I wrote a letter using my best handwriting possible. Uh, I think I just said about how I wanted to meet Mr. Bear, so my dad sent the letter to the address Mr. Bear said on the show. It stayed on all day anyway for some reason. It took us about a week to get a response, which I was surprised happened at all. I still have the letter I received on August 15th, 1999. It read, Thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, we watch movies, we go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at, the police cut out this address, Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I can't believe my dad never found any of this sketchy because he actually took me to the house. And then that's when the police became involved. Those endless questions, the pictures of terrified kids, the woods. That brings me back to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some fucked up shit back then. And now it seems he's trying to get in contact with me again. The entire police thing is coming back. That has brought 1999 back to me. Over a decade later, it's all happening again. People have been emailing me asking me exactly what happened in 1999, and I will get to that. See, those weird TV shows that I had been watching were apparently meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. And what Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. My dad actually drove me to Caledon, uh, to the address Mr. Bear left on the letter. The house was out in the outskirts of town, situated in open farmland. I still remember that house. It looked like an older farmhouse that seemed to have been built in the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up, and the house looked in a state of disrepair. As we walked up to it, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again and looking at the house and grounds in disbelief. Then the door opened. I expected Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see a police officer emerge from the creaking doorway. The officer began talking to Dad while I quickly asked if that was Mr. Bear's house. The officer glanced down at me, cringed slightly, and muttered, Oh, God, or something like that. He started talking quietly to my father so I couldn't hear, although Dad told me to go back to the car anyway. And then we just went home. Dad was quiet the entire way home, but I knew something had happened. My father clammed up, never told me anything about it for a long time. I forgot about it as well after a while. Channel 21 no longer came on the air, and when I asked Dad, he wouldn't acknowledge its existence. I think it was when I was 13 that I finally learned the truth. I remembered Channel 21 one day just out of the blue, and asked my dad about it. I guess he finally decided that I should hear the truth. Caledon Local 21 was a local access television channel that ran from October 1997 to August of 1999 in the Peel region of Ontario. The entire channel, all of the shows, were made from a house in Caledon, the one that I had visited and they were run by a man who was not really known by anyone in town. The channel was only available to older style televisions because of the signal. It was very weak and only receivable by rabbit ears. The man created all of the shows on the channel, all of which were kids shows. He was Mr. Bear and he was the mysterious cameraman. The real reason that he created the channel was more disturbing than what was originally thought. 
As you might have guessed, he kidnapped kids and held them in his cellar, but while most people thought that he was a serial child molester, he really wanted to use the kids for another purpose entirely. The day that I arrived, the man had fled his house the night before, the day before the police went in for their investigation. I wasn't the only one who was watching. Sorry for not answering any questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for some time. Um, anyway, let me finally set some things straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited the house previously owned by the man who ran Caledon Local 21. Two women lived there, operating a daycare business. <laughs> How ironic. Now to answer the questions you guys emailed me. Who else watched Caledon Local 21? Um, I know other people watched it for sure, including the kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found a few people on the Neoseeker forums who were discussing the shows from Caledon Local 21. They talked about two shows that I watched, but also another two that I'd never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all the shows that were broadcasted on 21. Here are the two that I've never heard of. The Fallen Angel and Life. I Am Real Life described it as a fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of the camera about how we must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. And Paint With The Soul. I Am Real Life and another guy called uh, Siggy92 were discussing this show. Uh, they described it as Blair Witch-like, as it consisted of the cameraman wandering around a forest at night, doing nothing particularly interesting. I'll go looking for the conversation and see if I can get the link for you. Where is Mr. Bear, or the guy who wore the costume? If I did know, I would have said earlier, I have no idea where this guy is or if he's dead or alive. Hopefully he's dead. When I see my dad's friend next time, I'll ask him about this. Um, maybe I can get a more definite answer. What did Mr. Bear do to the children? This is by far the most common question that I've been asked. I found this out in October as well via my dad's friend who's a retired Caledon regional officer. Apparently, the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the forest nearby. What he did there, police are not exactly sure how it happened, but 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 and 13 were found in a 15 by 15 foot ditch deep within the forest. My dad's friend did not want to go into exact details, but I'm seeing him next Thursday anyway, so maybe I can extort some more information from him then. That's all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog. I'll try to gather as much information as I can for my next post. I've actually been getting pretty interested in this myself. Uh, it should be my right to know what the hell happened to me and to those other kids. I'm sorry I haven't posted for a while. I kinda lost interest in this blog since I hit a standstill while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Caledon Local 21. However, a few weeks ago, I struck gold. I found some answers, surprisingly, from a father of the kid that I used to babysit. He lives just across from my street, and I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job either. He used to live near the woods outside of Caledon, and he witnessed the owner's activities in the woods. His name is Anthony Polo. When he lived in the small bungalow outside the woods, he would often venture in to smoke a joint or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Polo described that sometimes he would hear voices of children coming from deeper in the woods, as well as a glowing light off in the distance. He told me that these events started in late 1997. Note, this is around the time that Caledon Local 21 began airing. He apparently became annoyed by this happening every once in a while and actually went to investigate it. 
Polo then described what the whole scene looked like when he got there. There was a group of kids, he said, about 13 to 17 of them, aged from 5 to 12, gathered around a large fire pit with a burning fire. With them was a single adult. Polo talked to the man, noting his usual unkempt appearance. <laughs> he said he looked like a crack addict, as well as his constant twitching, and asked what he was doing out in the forest with the children. The man said that they were on a camping trip, something that they did frequently. Polo, not really suspecting anything, Caledon has one of the lowest crime rates in Canada, you see, simply left it at that and told them to be quieter, please. Polo then paused for a while before telling me that they never did get quieter, and in fact, sometimes he heard loud chanting from the children in an unknown language. He didn't bother meeting with the man again as he was intending to move away. I told Polo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it as he'd heard that the man was moving to Pickering from several other residents near that area. Here's what I now know. The man would take the kids into the woods regularly for camping. The fire pit Polo described may be the hole that the bodies of the children were found in. The children Polo saw are probably the ones that were found dead. The man moved to a city called Pickering. It's a smaller city east of Toronto. Now, I'll discuss this with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything that the police know about the man. I also want to see if he has any other knowledge of what was aired on Caledon Local 21. Good news, guys. I talked to my dad's friend, and he disclosed a lot of information for me. First, I asked if the police had any information on the man who ran Caledon 21. He replied that they've only had the same leads for years and never found a suspect. However, the Peel Regional Police do have some of the tapes that were found in the house Caledon Local 21 was broadcast from. He took me over so that I could watch a few. I guess I haven't said much about him yet. Um, my dad's friend's name is Mitchell Wilson pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge about what happened during the late 90s in that house. He feels that it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me anything. He took me to the Davis Road Police Station. If you don't know, this is the largest station in Caledon, and one of the largest within the Peel region itself. Each of the main stations around Peel have some of the tapes, and I was able to watch all of the footage that the Davis Road Station has. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any of the tapes home for obvious reasons. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10, Garbage Thrown Away. Paint with the Soul was one of the shows that I Am Real Life and Siggy92 discussed on the Neo Seeker forums. I told the police about this, and they informed me that 12 episodes of the show were made and broadcast between December 5th, 1997 and January 8th, 1998. Exactly as I Am Real Life and Siggy92 described, the episode opened with the cameraman wandering around in a forest. It appeared to be during the evening as it seemed the sun was setting. The cameraman walked along a path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage lying in the leaves. Uh, the cameraman looked around at the various wrappers, bottles, bags, and boxes, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. And the camera then focused on a single area before the man spoke. I recall that he spoke in a very timid, quiet voice, and I swear that I've heard it somewhere else before, like uh, on another of the Caledon 21 show episodes. I could barely hear what he was saying, but he mainly talked about how humans are garbage or something that had to do with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage, which would be us. It actually sounded really stupid, but still, a feeling of dread came over me. I mean, that forest was possibly where those bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 25 when the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, oh, shit, and chuckled a bit out loud. 
Of course, I got stares from the staff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear and how I still kept the letter that he sent me. Like the previous episode, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. The episode began with Mr. Bear waddling over to his cellar door with a bottle of orange juice in his paws. On the ground were 16 shot glasses as well as a small bottle that contained an unknown liquid. Mr. Bear poured an equal amount of orange juice into each glass before opening the smaller bottle and depositing one drop each into the glasses. Mr. Bear then went off camera. There were some minor sounds of shuffling and then Mr. Bear emerged from behind the camera's location. Following him were 16 children. Some of them looked as young as four, while others looked like they were practically teenagers. As the children entered, the administrator commented that this was the only episode that showed all 16 victims. The kids all looked rather content, except for the one who had visible bruises on his face, and unlike the other kids, he had a more fearful expression. He also looked about 11 to 12, which made me remember him. He was the kid who had asked about his sister and subsequently met an unknown fate at the end of episode 23, the one episode that I had watched during July of 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed that yes, it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, the one that only aired once at 3 p.m. on one day in July of 1999. The police still haven't found that tape. Mr. Bear then broke into songs singing about citrus fruits and how good vitamin C was for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by the bear mask. The kids all drank their juice, the one from episode 23 doing it rather reluctantly, and the episode ended. After viewing the tapes in possession of the Davis Road Police Station, I'm satisfied, but only temporarily. I still want to know the full story. The police just keep giving me the same crap about the creator of Caledon 21 being a fetishist pedophile and an apparent cultist. I'll sign off for now, get into university first, and get information later. Hopefully, I'll get back to this blog as soon as possible. Last month, I finally got my G2 license. In Ontario, Canada, this allows you to drive a car by yourself, as well as with some passengers after six months. I, of course, took advantage of this and drove into Caledon for a little Sunday drive. Now, since I haven't updated this blog in a while, I figured out I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than the last time I'd seen it in October. The place was no longer used as a daycare and just sat there, abandoned. However. It did have a for sale sign showing that someone still owned it and wanted to get rid of it. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, uh, mainly that of the day my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. And a feeling of dread came over me. What happened to those children while they were in that house? I walked up the steps to the front door and peered through the window. Inside I could see a nearly empty hallway with a few boxes at the end. And at the end of that hallway, to the right, was an open doorway, presumably leading to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, both apparently leading to rooms visible through the windows outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located, and whether it had been sealed up. I walked around the back of the house, and neatly found my answer. Two wooden doors, lying at an almost flat angle, were padlocked shut. This had to lead to the cellar. Not wanting to hang around, you can't imagine what was going through my mind at the time. I departed. Behind the house, the empty field continued on until it reached a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if that forest was where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, ah, fuck it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was quiet save for a few periodic sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. I cautiously made my way deeper into the woods, not really caring about the fact that I had no idea where I was going. I 
don't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something I had to find. I came to a thinner part of the woods and a few small houses in the distance. Polo's house crossed my mind and I wondered if one of these homes belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized logs gathered around a black charred area showing that a small fire had been lit there recently. Hey, get the fuck out of our fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. I turned to my left and I saw two dark clothed people running towards me. My initial thought was to run. However, as they came closer, I saw they were really just kids. Uh, in their early teens, possibly 13 or 14, maybe even as young as 12. As they approached me, I realized my size as well. I'm 6'1", while they could have been no bigger than 5'8". One might have been 5'7". We said, get the fuck out, the larger one who was wearing a slipknot shirt said half-heartedly. I stood my ground and simply shrugged. The shorter one, who was wearing a metallic t-shirt, swung out a butterfly knife and held it in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to, I said in a deep, serious tone, trying to sound as badass as possible. I pulled out my cell phone. The two kids withdrew slightly, the one in the Metallica shirt putting away the knife. Look, dude, we don't like people in our fort, so can you just go? The one in the slipknot shirt said, obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyway, so I uttered out a simple, fine, and turned before I realized that this was a great opportunity. Say, did either of you hear about a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about 13 years ago? I asked them. The two looked at each other in confusion before the one wearing the Metallica shirt answered. Yeah, everybody knows about that guy. He said to me as if I were stupid. The kid in the slipknot shirt continued, He still lives around here, in the storm drain. My big brother's friend says that he saw him in a bear costume once, wandering around the forest at night. My instincts told me this was probably a lie, and that the owner of Caledon Local 21 is probably long gone, only existing as folklore in this smaller, isolated community. However, I am human, and the thought of the mysterious unknown sparked my interest. And where is that storm drain? I asked, just out of curiosity. I didn't actually believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments, his eyes seemingly full of annoyance. Yet, he was curious. You're not from around here, are you? Why'd you even come here? Now, I do admit that I was startled by the nature of his question. However, I figured I might as well explain why I was there, just in case people mistook my intentions. So I told them about my experience with the man and with Caledon Local 21, and that I had to come out here to maybe seek out some sort of closure. Even I wasn't really convinced by this. The kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description about how to get to the storm drain. Shortly thereafter, I decided to just turn around the way I'd come and head back to the house, leaving the kids at their fort. Now, you're probably wondering why I left out the details about what the kids told me just now. It's because I'm choosing to conclude what I've gathered now. Here's what they told me, in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kids' fort, the same direction that I'd been heading. The drain ends at a small river where access water is drained out. Near here is a small playground. They told me that people rarely use it anymore. The man supposedly lives in the large pipe that the rainwater drains out of. People have seen him, although he's always either wearing a bear mask or the full body costume. Note here, I do not believe that this is true and is simply a myth made up by the residents of Caledon. The story doesn't seem plausible in any way. When they see him, why would no one call the police? Doesn't he look suspicious? Other questions like these leave the story invalid in my mind. 
I may visit the storm drain at some point, not because I believe this story, but because I want an excuse to visit Caledon again so this blog doesn't die. With no more tapes to watch, I don't know what to talk about anymore. Thanks for continuing to support me and my blog. I know that many are looking forward to more information about what happened in Caledon during the year 1999, and I will do my best to continue my research on the topic. Elliot out. Wow. Nearly five months since I last updated. I'm guessing everyone pretty much thinks I'm dead, right? Well, thankfully, I'm not. But in all seriousness, I really have been busy these past few months, and a blog about something that could have killed me as a kid is a little low on my current priorities list. As of now, I'm living in Waterloo, Ontario, attending the University of Waterloo for computer engineering. Yeah, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park, so obviously, I mostly forgot about this blog. But as you can see, I am now back. I remembered to visit the storm drain that the kids from the Caledon Forest told me about. It was out in a clearing between the wooded areas nearby a marsh. Unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing, save for a turtle that retreated into its built-in home when it saw me. I snapped some pics of the pipe, which I posted here as well. Also, let me tell you, it was not a storm drain like they said it was. What I saw was a simple pipe, possibly to channel the access water from the marsh. When I returned from Caledon, however, I simply kept putting off uploading everything until I forgot all about my blog. It just didn't seem important anymore. Please forgive me. It wasn't until only recently that I became interested in the case again. On September 10th of this year, I received an email from this email address, return to the bee at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? Well, it gets better. I'm going to copy and paste the exact email that the guy sent me. Here. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy, you see that this story may or may not be true, but it could happen. There are many slots for airtime, and if you have money, you can have a public access television channel. Some public access channels share airtime like EWTN, religious channel based out of Michigan. That shows Catholic-based programming, but during off-air hours, have independent shows or just blue screen. Cable networks have MT channels available for rent space, so the scenario of a pedo renting a channel based on TV is not far-fetched at all. However, public access TV is widely reviewed and can be terminated at any time. These are the rules for the United States, not for Canada, where this story took place. So if this happened in the U.S., the pedo would be tracked and arrested immediately. Yes, this story could happen, but is unlikely. 100 Fuzzy Hugs, Mr. Bear Now obviously the letter is fake and it sounds almost corrupted, but still, I would like to thank whoever sent it, though they could use some English lessons. Just reading this letter creeped me out. But because of it, I'm now full of new interest to continue my blog. I guess it's just funny trying to pursue the mysteries that I've always sort of questioned. Now my roommate knows all about this. Uh, he thought that the letter was real and actually seemed more scared than I was for a second. But then I shrugged it off, so... He did too. I mean, what are the chances of this being real? How would Mr. Bear know all this about public access TV and about when I went to Caledon on those locations? Moreover, how would he know my email or that I'm still interested in his cellar? Huh. I'm going to send a reply to return the bee. Wow, uh, just looking at that email address, you can tell someone wanted to freak me out. It didn't really work though, although to whoever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter. Maybe I can find out more about what happened to Mr. Bear. Hopefully, because 
Although I don't buy that email, a part of me still feels anxious because of it. And thank you to all those who are still following me and have become avid fans. You're also why I'm choosing to continue this. Thanks, guys. Well, uh, <laughs> I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't checked it for so long. Um, I have my reasons, and I'd rather not discuss them just yet. It's been a rather traumatic month for me. Some of you are right. I shouldn't have gone back trying to relive the mysteries of my childhood, but I couldn't resist. It's been a month since my last post, and a lot has happened. Now, let's recap where I am right now with regards to the whole Mr. Bear incident. Return the bee at Hotmail is no longer in use. I tried replying to the email, but I got no reply in return. I tried again a little while later, but still no response. I've actually moved up to Ottawa, the capital of Canada for those who don't know, for university, so I haven't been back to Caledon or back home in the Peel region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving, as you could probably guess. I've had to make a new email account because people keep prank mailing me pretending to be Mr. Bear. Thanks a lot, guys. Why have I ventured back to this blog? Well, um, Mitchell Wilson, remember my dad's ex-cop friend, gave me a phone call on October 23rd about a tape that was found in a branch of the Brampton Public Library. Brampton is my hometown, in case you haven't picked up on that. He claims that he isn't allowed to discuss the contents of the tape with me as it's still in evidence, but he asked me to come check it out when I return home. That tape got the gears grinding again because we all know what was on the last tapes that I saw. I can only imagine what might be on it. I'm guessing that it must have something to do with Caledon Local 21. I guess I just wanted to say that I'm continuing this blog and thank you to everyone who still follows it. I don't know when my next entry will be, but when I see what's on that tape, I will write what I find. I don't know what to expect, but the idea of seeing another tape has gotten me interested in this whole mystery all over again. Elliot. The end of 2010 into the new year was dreadfully long for me. University's been giving me the usual sleepless nights, since I transferred to Ottawa, which is the place to party! Sorry about the sarcasm. But now I'm back home with my dad in Brampton, the town that I grew up in. Got home on the 18th of December, and I've been visiting with friends and family. Or at least that's what I would rather have done. Now that the festive holiday cheer that I usually have at this time of the month is absent. To answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend Mitchell promised to show me. These tapes, however, they're a curse. I want to know more, but I want to forget everything. I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes, not only for myself, but for all of you guys who are just as intrigued as I am by that man in the bear suit from my past. However, viewing those tapes, I feel that pit of dread inside me again. That feeling that I know all those kids in the videos are dead. That I could have been one of them. And that humanity's a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped this paragraph for the juicier details below, thank you for listening to my rambling. On January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was a time where I could come by and view the tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm, so he said that I could come by any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me, so I braved the slushy roads and the terrible Brampton drivers and made my way to the Peel Regional Police Station at the Bromalia City Center. I met with Wilson at the front desk. He led me up to the second floor and into a small office. He instructed me to have a seat and to wait while he went and got the tapes. Before leaving the office, though, he turned to me and he said, I know you're curious, but are you sure you want to do this? 
Of course I did. Or at least I thought so. Besides, Wilson had pulled a lot of strings to get me in there and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. This particular station had two tapes on hand. I was only able to watch a few minutes of footage, however, because the second tape was apparently too damaged to be played in a VCR. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 30 Mr. Bear never ceases to disturb me, especially after what almost happened to me when I was younger. This episode takes place outside in a forest at dusk, making it kind of hard to see, especially considering the quality of the film, which is a trademark of anything from Caledon Local 21. The episode started with the camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear, aiming at himself. That bear mask, it looked more sinister in the shadows of the trees. The unmistakable, muffled voice spoke up. Hello, children. Today I will be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. I will be delivering them to a faraway land where they will surely be happy. Mr. Bear turned the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer, but what stood out the most was that the trailer contained seven motionless children lying side by side. The, the, this here is the first load, but more will be on their way soon. Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera at a large burlap tarp spread on the ground. He picked the tarp up, revealing a large hole that must have been at least 12 feet deep, maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of Mr. Bear taking each kid and dropping them into the hole. I asked Wilson if the children were dead, to which he shook his head and replied, Not yet. Soon all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions due to being tossed in, but they remained unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on the great journey that awaits them, Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera toward multiple bottles of gasoline beside a bush. The camera zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that these were seven of the 16 victims found burned to death. The gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of burning children. Who the fuck would do that? That feeling of dread found me once again when I realized that I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he previously lied. The other tape confiscated by the Bromalia police branch did indeed work and contained the filming of the actual burning. However, he had felt that I wouldn't be able to handle it because of the disturbing and graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe I can't. I don't even want to see it. I'm satisfied for now, but I just need some time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran Caledon Local 21 is still out there. More to come soon. Elliot. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Elliot. Elliot was a clever boy who loved playing with his friends. One day, he watched a lovely television show about a bear and his children friends. The children loved helping each other, as good children should, but they also loved the bear. The bear also loved the children since the children were so good at helping him and the fallen angel. The children and the bear wanted to play forever with the help of their angel friend. But the fallen angel needed even more help, so the children had to give the ultimate sacrifice. Because that's what friends do, Elliot. They help each other. Help us, Elliot. Burn with us, Elliot. I want you, Elliot. He wants you back to my cellar. Pretty please?
with sugar and icing on top. Mr. B. I wanted to update more. I truly did. However, certain circumstances had turned me off to the whole Caledon Local 21 thing. I've, uh, since then had hundreds of emails about my blog and was even in contact with a magazine about my story. But now is the time to come clean to everyone. Where have I been for an entire year? Well, the story of Pandora's box is true, and I opened it. I opened it when I watched the second tape in the possession of the Bromalia Police Branch. The other subject that I'd like to address is the number of joke or fake emails that I've been getting from people claiming to be Mr. Bear. But let's start with the second tape, as that is what traumatized me into stopping my search temporarily. After a few weeks of playing silent, I decided to ask Mitchell Wilson if I could view that infamous second tape that he'd talked about. I don't know why I just felt that the viewing of the tape would give me some closure. Wilson was obviously reluctant to show me, but I was persistent. He gave me an offer. If I was still interested, by the time that I turned 20, he would show me the tape. Not being able to do much else, I just played the waiting game. By the time my 20th birthday rolled around, I was definitely still interested. I gave Wilson a call, during which he admitted that he had hoped that I'd just forget about asking him again, but I wasn't taking no for an answer. You don't really need to see it, he kept telling me. But I did need to see it. I had to at this point. Sure enough, he invited me to the Bromalia branch one Monday afternoon. Having watched every Saw film and a video of animal slaughterhouses in my ethics class, I was sure that I'd be able to handle whatever the tape could throw at me. Oh, how naive I was. Mr. Bear's Cellar, episode 31. When Wilson went to collect the tape from evidence, the officer in charge of the evidence room shook his head at me, his face saying, What are you doing? Wilson explained that this tape included the last known episode of Mr. Bear's Cellar. I, rightfully, assumed that I would be seeing the fate of the children and began to feel a sense of dread. The episode opened inside a forest, the usual one from the previous episodes. This fact took me a while to realize because it was night. The trees and leaves just looked like shapes dancing around in the darkness. A faint glow of light was present on the right side of the screen. There wasn't any audio. It appeared to be a windy night, yet the trees weren't making any noise. Slowly, the camera began to pan towards the glow, revealing smoke rising from a hole with the tips of flames peeking over the top. Wilson paused at this point. Are you sure that you want to see this? He asked me. I insisted on it, even though a voice in my head was telling me not to. The video continued. The cameraman moved toward the hole, showing a pit of fire. This was the hole that I'd seen in the previous episode, only this time it was filled with shapes. I could see them moving around, fluttering, flailing, some motionless. I knew perfectly well what they were. The camera began to adjust to the light and... Uh, burning flesh. Red, black, a blur of surreal movement and colors. I wish I could forget what I saw, but you... You... You can't forget a scene like that. This wasn't a horror movie, this was reality. Human beings, children, were being killed in a horrifying way, a fate that I could potentially have met as well. And then the video cut to dawn, the camera now positioned farther away from the hole. The fire was out, however, there was still smoke rising. A figure was up ahead, in frame. I recognized it right away, the Mr. Bear suit but it was laid out on the ground. Empty, it looked just as unnerving. The suit was laid out in the shape of a cross. 
The cameraman did a lap around the suit, treating it like a treasured artifact. Placed at the head of the suit was a sign. In bold red letters, I-N-R-I was printed. The cameraman moved back to the end of the suit, zooming into the bear's face, and the episode finally ended. I was speechless. It was like a, a dream. You can find a lot of terrible things on the internet, but I had never seen anything like that. Wilson asked if I was okay, and I replied with a shaky yes. I assured him as we left that I was fine and that the video gave me some closure over the whole incident. He didn't seem too confident about it, but he left it at that. He was right, though. I had nightmares for weeks. I gave up. I didn't care about the whole thing anymore. A sick man burned a bunch of kids alive, attracting them with fake kids TV channel. I, I could have been one of his victims, yet I'm still here. I suppose I should be grateful, but I feel guilty. Am I still here only by pure luck? Ten months later, I'm back, but now I need to address something else. My email has been flooded with messages. Some people ask for more details, some ask if I can upload the tapes, and some people email me claiming to be Mr. Bear. First, I cannot get the tapes uploaded as A. They're in police possession as evidence, and B. I have no idea how to transfer VHS onto a computer. As for people pretending to be Mr. Bear, you're not fooling me. When you have dozens of people pretending to be the same person, it doesn't work. I've even seen a fake Caledon Local 21 YouTube channel, which is cute, but still not real. Even more annoying is the fact that someone hacked my account just to put up some demented poem about me on this blog. I'll leave it in the entry above this one just to show you guys. I've contacted my webmaster about the entry and I was told that it was posted on Halloween. <laughs> mm, spooky. Attached to the email paintwithb at aol.com which I assume is another joke email. Look, I'm over episode 31 now. The images of what I saw will stick with me for a long time. But I want to do one last hurrah. I'll get in touch with Mitchell Wilson again and hopefully get set up with the tapes in the possession of the other Peel Police branches. I'll try and update you guys as soon as I can. I'm sure this won't take long again. And thank you to everyone who still reads this. Elliot. Yeah, when you seek after something horrible, you invite horror into your life. Monsters, magic, aliens, or just plain old psychos. Stay scary, wildlings. Remember that even if you've escaped something once, that doesn't mean it can't come back. And make the most of your nights.